pray. That's awesome. God is good. Some of y'all know that. All right, I say God is good. You say all the time, and then we reverse it. You ready? God is good. All the time. Folks, that is true even when we don't feel like it, when we don't think so, and the circumstances don't dictate it. God is still good all the time. He is worthy of our praise. You might be wondering, who am I? I'm Marty Dupree. I work with the Little River Association. It's an association of churches in Harnett County, uh, mostly, and kind of around it. Uh, Spout Springs is part of that association, and uh, Pastor Steve let me preach today. He is here, uh, and I love your staff. I'm friends with your staff. Uh, They're a great bunch of people with... Uh, Steve and Barry and Leslie and Rich and Nancy and Heather, uh, I love your folks and uh, thank you for letting me be here today. Our word today is gospel and we're going to talk about gospel conversations. That's what we're going to talk about and I'm going to jump in here and I think they're going to put my PowerPoint up and I'll introduce my family. I have five children. Uh, My wife's name is Angela and uh, let me see when it comes up here. We'll start uh, talking about it but uh, if you have your Bibles and you want to go ahead and turn, here we go. This is my family right here. Um, I think it's just on this screen. Uh, this makes it easy, Steve. This is kind of cool when you got this right here. Um, my two sons are on the left side, and my wife uh, uh, is here. My uh, middle daughter, Darcy, her husband, Courtney, Al, and Harper. So the three girls on that side are my daughters, my wife in the middle, my son's on this side. This son was in the Army. And uh, on child number two, he got out of the army because he would be gone all the time. And now uh, child number three is due in two weeks. And my wife, Angela, and I have been married 34 years, and so it's been great. I will tell you this, having all these children will increase your prayer life. Amen? It will cause you to pray. Having one child will make you pray. You'll pray twice as much if it's a daughter. And uh, then you start throwing boys in, they tear your house up. So... uh, yeah, it's kind of crazy. Is this live where I can click it? It would help if I turn it on, wouldn't it? Yeah, one thing I wanted to uh, mention, I have a website. It's martydupree.org, martydupree.org. And on my website are all kinds of free resources like how to pray for your children, preparing for personal revival, evangelism crash course. There's all kinds of things on there, but uh, one of them is on how to pray for your children. There's my website, martydupree.org. So uh, that's good. And our word for today is gospel. The word gospel means good news. It literally means good news. In Greek, it's the word euangelion. It's where we get the word evangel or evangelism, which literally means sharing the good news. And we'll talk more about that. We're going to talk about gospel conversations today. So let me pray for us, and then we're going to jump in. Steve, thanks for letting me be here to preach today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you. We praise you. We worship you. Father, you are the God of creation. You're the God of restoration. You're the God of redemption. And Lord, you are the God of salvation, you alone. Father, you alone are worthy of our worship and our praise and our adoration. So Father, today, open our hearts to be receptive. Open our eyes that we might see what you want us to see. Open our ears that we might hear your voice speak into our very hearts. Father, whatever attitudes that we have that might be barriers, help us to understand your attitude as you love us but you hate our sin because you are a holy God. Father, release us from all the sins and all the things that hold us back and set us free to follow you. Father, transform our lives today that we would not be conformed to this world, we would not be conformed to churchianity, but Lord, we would be conformed to biblical Christianity and the image of your son, Jesus. So Father, we commit this time to you. Fill this place with your spirit. Speak to us and use us for your glory. And Father, we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You also might have an outline in your um, bulletin. If you open up your bulletin, I will somewhat follow that outline so you'll have that with you. Uh, But I want to get us started. I want to tell you about three different young people, Wendy, Jason, and Kevin, all these people from California. I ask all three of these young people the same question in the course of conversation. Do you have any particular spiritual beliefs? Do you have any particular spiritual beliefs? Everyone I'm to a person basically gave me the same exact answer. They said, no, but I believe there's something out there. I believe there's something out there. Folks, that is the world we live in today. That's the culture we live in today. People aren't really sure if they believe anything or what they believe, but they believe there's something out there. And the reason they believe there's something out there is because the way God created us. In Ecclesiastes 3, um, it says that God has set eternity in the heart of every human being. So every human being, by the creation of God, has a sense 
that there's something out there, there's a God. And so as we begin to look at this today, we'll talk more about how do you engage people in conversations? How do you talk with them? So uh, uh, that's why we're calling this Gospel Conversations. And I really, uh, I'm going to talk about a, a little Bible study called The Story. The website is viewthestory.com. And I like it because when you pull this up, it'll say watch the video. And it's a six-minute video that gives an overview of the framework of the Bible, the creation, the fall, the rescue, and the restoration makes the Bible into one whole story. And so it's a great tool, and we'll talk about that. But here's my favorite question. I love to engage a conversation. Not the first question. People always ask me, so how do you engage people? I say, well, I ask them what their name is and where you're from and whatever T-shirt they have on, I'll tell them I like it or I don't. And if they've got on a Duke shirt, I'll say, you know, my favorite color is royal blue, but I don't pull to the devil. So, you know, it's just uh, a, a fun way to connect with people. But engaging conversations. Using this question, I'm going to go back. I'm going to tell you about... These three people from California. This happened a couple of summers ago. Uh, Wendy, Jason, and Kevin. I was flying back from Dallas, Texas, and I get on an airplane, and um, Guillermo Soriano, who worked with me, was sitting across the aisle. This lady comes, sits down next to the window. Her name is Wendy. We start talking. Wendy, where are you from? California. Where do you go to school? Uh, San, Jose, San Jose State University. Where do you major in? English and political science. So we chatted for a little while, and then I asked her, I said, well, Wendy, do you have any particular spiritual beliefs? And she looked at me and said, no, sir, I really don't, but I believe there's something out there. I believe there's something out there. I said, well, um, Wendy, I've got this little booklet. It's called The Story, and it's really kind of like a little Bible study. And it asks four questions. Where do we come from? What went wrong? Is there any hope? And what does the future hold? And I said, have you ever thought about this question? She said, oh, yeah. I said, well, here, take a look at it. Tell me what you think. It's called The Story. So she read it pretty quickly, and she hands it back to me. And I said, oh, you can keep it. And she said, well, that's a pretty good overview summary of the Bible. I thought that was really funny because my next question was, have you ever read the Bible? Oh, no, I've never read the Bible. <laughs> so, folks, a good idea to carry a Bible with you that you can give away, not your, your teaching Bible, your preaching Bible, but something you can give away when you travel. And so I had a little New Testament, and it had, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all the way through. And being that she's an English major, and being that she's never read the Bible, I just took some time to explain you know, the kind of the layout of the Bible and how it was written. And I, I encouraged her, I said, when you take the Bible and you start to read it for the first time, uh, just start in one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and then just read straight through the New Testament. That will tell you what Christianity is supposed to be about and how Christians are really supposed to act. And by the way, most people wonder that because Christians don't always act like they're supposed to, unfortunately. But anyway, so she starts reading. Well, it's, we're flying from Dallas to Raleigh, so it's about a two-hour flight. And we're landing in Raleigh-Durham, and I look over, and she's in chapter 19 of Matthew. I said, wow, have you read 19 chapters? She said, yeah, remember, I'm an English major. I said, that's good. I don't read that fast, but what would you make of it? She said, well, this gives a great backstory to the overview story that you gave me. And folks, that's where we want our conversations to go. We want our conversations to go so that people read God's Word for themselves. Because you and I don't change anybody, but God's Word, by His Holy Spirit, can change our hearts for eternity. And so, encourage people in a gentle, nice way to read the Bible for themselves. And that's an important thing. That happened on July 31st. Same week, August 4th, we're going down to Oak Island uh, for vacation. We always rent a beach house. We love air conditioning in the south. We get there, we're moved in, and realize air conditioning didn't work, so we call, they send a guy out. His name's Jason. Jason and I start talking. Jason, where are you from? California. What brought you to North Carolina? He said, I came out to visit my mom. I liked it. There's a lot of uh, HVAC work, and so I stayed. So after, Jason caught the house on fire. I'm not even kidding. He's welding a little copper pipe, and it catches the under thing of the garage on fire. And so he looks at me and goes, would you call the fire department? I'm like, no, dude, you call the fire department. You're the one that started. But I didn't say that. I just said, no, you call the fire department. He got it all put out, but we had to evacuate. Police came. It was kind of crazy. But it created a great dynamic for a great conversation. So he got there at, at, at about 2.15. And I said, uh, uh, Jason, I said, uh, do you have any particular spiritual beliefs? And he looked at me and he goes, I can't believe you asked me that question. He goes, no, I really don't. But I think about that a lot. I wonder if there's something out there. And so we start talking. He gets here at about, I said 2.15. He actually got there at quarter till 2. He does not leave till about 6.15. He's there for about two hours working, and the other half the time we were having a conversation. And one of the things that we talked about and I explained to him was the overview of the Bible. 
that it just doesn't start with Jesus. It's the creation. God created everything. It was perfect. Then Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, and they messed up, and it caused a curse on the earth, and that's why the whole world screwed up. But God had a plan to rescue us, and it's through the person of Jesus. And then ultimately, there's going to be a restoration. There's going to be a new heaven, a new earth. And he said, man, that makes a lot of sense. And he asked question after question. So anyway, I go to the beach. <laughs> And I come back, and it's about time for supper. It's about 6 o'clock, 4 to 6, something like that. And Jason's wrapping up. He said, man, I enjoyed talking with you earlier. I got some more questions. Can I ask you some more questions? And so he'd ask me a question, Steve, and he'd shake my hand and thank me because he was, like, ready to leave. And then he'd say he realized I was okay to talk to him. I wasn't going to, like, scare him or anything. And he'd ask me another question. He did that three times. So I said, hey, Steve, I'm not Steve. I said, Jason, why don't you come eat supper with us? He that but I've got another appointment I got to go to but uh, can I ask you another question and so I gave him a, a Jesus video gave him a Bible and really encouraged him to read the Bible for himself he said this has been fascinating thanks for taking time to talk to me and uh, yeah I need to read the Bible that's what I need to do and folks people want to talk about this stuff they just don't want to be preached to they don't want to be talked down to we all know we're messed up we all know that we're broken can't fix ourselves we'll talk more about that so that was on uh, July, I mean August the 4th, August the 10th, pulling in my driveway, come home from vacation, there's a car in my driveway with a California tag, I'm not even kidding, I'm like, what is up with all these California people, and, uh, but it was fun, so anyway, guy gets out of the car, we start talking, his name was Kevin, and I said, Kevin, what brings you to North Carolina, he said, I've been selling books with Southwestern Books, I've been in the Garner area, I live in the Garner area, um, really closer to Fuquay, but um, for 13 weeks, and today is my last day of sales. I thought, oh, okay, this is a divine appointment. So you're in my driveway. <laughs> so I began to talk to Kevin. I said, Kevin, uh, where do you go to school? San Diego State University. What are you majoring in? Aerospace engineering. I thought, oh boy, I got me a rocket scientist this time. This will be interesting. So when I asked him after a little chit chat, and who we knew some people, same people, I said, uh, so Kevin, do you have any particular spiritual beliefs? He goes, I'm not sure that I believe anything. I think there might be something out there. So what do you do? I mean, he quickly changed the subject to what I did. And I said, well, I'm a church consultant. I work with churches. And, um, and we talked about it. He said, so like, what do you do? And I said, well, one of the things, I resource churches. And he said, like, how? And I said, well, with materials and things. And I had an Evangel Cube. If you've ever heard of an Evangel Cube, it's like a Rubik's Cube gospel, but it is pictures and it explains the crucifixion process. And so I showed it to him. He seemed mildly interested. I said, hey, I know you want to talk about your books. Why don't you come back in a little while? My wife's not home yet. I come back at about 5, and we'll talk. So he came back about 5. We talked some more in the driveway, more gospel conversation. I said, hey, man, we're not ready yet to talk with you, but why don't you come eat supper with us? He goes, I'm not supposed to do that, but what time? I said, about 7.15. We'll all be here. Come on back. He shows up. We eat on the back porch. He starts telling all these stories. He's been going door to door selling books all summer long in Garner. And he said dogs chased him. People held guns to him. People slammed doors on him. And he had us just laughing. You'd think I talk a lot. He never stopped talking. It was amazing. So about 8 o'clock, we're wrapping up dinner. And I said, hey, Kevin, this afternoon we had a lot of conversation about spiritual things. What did you make of that? He said, well, that reminds me. He said, I got a lot of questions I want to ask you. For one solid hour, he's asking questions. And here's what he said to me. He said, no one's ever taken time to explain any of this to me. And when you explain the overview of the Bible as one story of the creation to the restoration, he said, for the first time, that made sense. He said, I know the world screwed up. That makes sense. And so he asked a ton of questions. I mean, Barry, I'm the evangelist. I was ready for him to go. I mean, I'm like, don't you have another appointment? I mean, because he talked and talked and talked. But what I found out, and this is what I'm learning, it's if, if people find that you are safe to talk to, they'll ask you all kinds of questions because you're not going to beat them up. You're not going to condemn them. You're not going to tell them where they're going to go if they don't straighten out. And they want to talk. And so, folks, engage people in conversation. Get to know them, but then... And I'm going to teach you at the end today kind of what I call the three-story method. You listen to their story so that you can tell them your story, what God's done in your life, so that you can tell them his story. Their story, your story, his story. So we'll talk more about that. But anyway, that's some, some introduction there to uh, some gospel conversations. Oh, and the rest of the story with Kevin is, he said, you remember that Rubik's Cube gospel thing you showed me? He said, uh, my roommate goes to Moody Bible Institute. We've been having this conversation all summer long. Folks, when you engage with people, you don't really know where they are in that process of their relationship with God. If this is the cross, 
Some people are ready to respond and they're ready to become a Christian. When you ask them, they'll come to Christ. But more people are over here. They need to get their questions answered. They need to bring to the teaching or the preaching of the gospel. Far more people are over here. They need the seed sown. They need to know you love them, you care about them, you've invited them to church, you've given them a Bible, you've invited them to Bible study. So whether we're sowing or cultivating or harvesting, all that's an equally important part of that process of bringing people to Christ. And so many times we have this idea that somebody says they're going to do evangelism. It sounds like we're going to go out and hit somebody in the head with a Bible. We're going to get them in a headlock and tell them where to go if they don't straighten out. We all know that's not the way to win friends and influence enemies. Amen? But evangelism, the word means, euangelion, means the gospel. It means good news. And true evangelism is an act of compassion, not an act of aggression. It's caring about a soul. And people pick up on that in a conversation, whether you're genuine or whether you actually care about them or not, or you're trying to do something to them or get something from them. You all know that's true. So just be genuine and compassionate as you talk to people. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.11 that God has set eternity in the heart of every human being. Blaise Pascal was a great mathematician, theologian in the 1600s. He wrote a book called Pensies, which is his thoughts. And he said, in the heart of every human being is a God-shaped vacuum that can only adequately and accurately be filled by Jesus Christ. So ultimately, we're not just looking for God. We're looking for a relationship with God, and that's going to be through Jesus Christ. So we'll talk more about that today. Now, look at this survey here. Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, Jewish, Muslim, other, none. Now, if you did this survey back in the 70s in North Carolina, it wouldn't have those questions. It would say, are you a Baptist, are you Methodist, are you Episcopal, are you Lutheran, are you Pentecostal, are you Catholic, are you other religions? But notice it has all the religions. But notice that the box that's checked is none, none. Folks, that is the fastest growing religious grouping, if you will, in all of North America. It's people who consider themselves nuns. I'm not talking about a Catholic nun. I'm talking about an N-O-N-E nun. They have no religious preference. And in some ways, you think, well, that's a crisis that, you know, re re requires a response. But in some ways, it's really not a crisis at all. It's really kind of good because we're not trying to undo people from being committed to some other religion. Uh, they have an opportunity to, to respond to Christ and to be open to uh, what God may want to do in their life. So keep that in mind as we think about this. Uh, James Emery White's uh, written a book called The Rise of the Nuns, if you want to talk about that. One out of five Americans consider themselves this. It's really more like 40% now, because when you talk about people under 30, it's like one out of three. That's probably one out of three, even under 40. So people don't consider themselves to have any particular religious preference. Now, another thing, 88% say they're not searching for religion. Guess what? They're not. They're looking for a relationship. People aren't looking for religion. They're looking for a relationship. I was at the State Fair. Have any of y'all ever been to the State Fair in Raleigh? I don't know if you have or not, but um, it's a lot of fun and they have a lot of good food when they have it. They didn't have it this year. I think they still had some of the food, though. You could go eat. But um, my wife loves to get the North Carolina ice cream. You always have to wait in line, but there's a place called Butcher Brothers right across from it. You can get a deaf dog, one of those big sausages or steak sandwich, which is what I get. And they had a little place to sit down. And one time this couple comes and sits down right across the table from me. Guy's in a three-piece suit. He's got perfect Jesus hair. It turns out it's his wife sits down. And I start talking to him and uh, ask him where they're from. His name um, it was Colin, and he had an accent. And I said, oh, I said, I know you have an accent. Where are you from? He goes, I'm from United Kingdom. And I said, well, you don't sound like you're from London. He said, you're right. That's very good. You, I, I'm from Wales. And so we started talking. I asked him, I said, well, uh, how did you all meet each other? Because she was from North Carolina. In fact, her dad sat down. He's retired military, 22 years in the Army, and he is really staring at me like, who is this guy? <laughs> he was checking me out. He didn't say anything. And so uh, uh, I began to talk with him. And I asked him, I said, well, how did you meet? And then I just asked the next normal question. And they said, we met at university. And I said, where'd you go to university? He said, Sheffield University. I said, uh, in England. He said, yeah. I said, what did you major in? He said, uh, we majored in uh, philosophy. I said, well, who's your favorite philosopher? Immanuel Kant. I thought, ooh, that's like a German atheist. I'm not sure about that. My wife sat down about that time. I didn't say anything. I'm just interviewing, just asking questions. And then I said to him, I said, um, they, I said, we, he, I said, what brought you to uh, the state fair? Because, I mean, he's like all dressed up, and I thought, I'm master of the obvious. I said, you were really dressed up. <laughs> I said, what's the occasion? And he said, we just got married. I said, really? And you came to the state fair? He said, yeah, we got married in Sanford, and we drove up US-1 to the state fair. I said, all right, there you go. And so after some more conversation, about philosophy and their background. I said, 
Well, so do you have any particular spiritual beliefs? And he sets up proper like, and he goes, well, I believe in God. And he looks at his brand new wife, and he goes, so what do you think about that? I'm thinking, dude, isn't that a little late for that question? And she was a little more indignant. She goes, well, I believe in God too, but I don't believe in organized religion. And I started laughing. I said, that's funny. I said, I'm a church consultant, and I don't believe in organized religion either. I said, man's way of trying to connect to God is through religion. And that's why there are so many different ways to try to connect to God. I said, but God's way of trying to connect to us is through a person, the person of Jesus Christ. I said, can I show you something? And so I go to my phone, and I pull up the app for the story, and I show them those four questions. Where do we come from? What went wrong? Is there any hope? And what does the future hold? I said, have you ever thought about those questions? And she said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And so I said, well, let me show you this. And the creation, the fall, the rescue, the restoration. And I showed them and went all the way through it. And then the lady said, and I said, hey, if you don't mind I, me having your email, I'll just send you the app and you can see the video. And she said, well, hand me your phone. She typed in her email and she sent it to herself. And so people are open, even if they initially don't seem like they are, they really are looking for truth. They're looking for the Bible and they like to have conversations. So look at this scale here. Zero to ten. Zero being no relationship with Christ, no relationship with God at all. Ten, having a saving faith. This would be a follower of Jesus, a believer. And where are people on this, this scale? Well, I put eight over here except basic Christian beliefs. I grew up in North Carolina. I've lived a few places, but I grew up in the 70s and 80s. Pretty much everybody in North Carolina in the 70s and 80s believed in God. You could just assume, which is dangerous to do, but you could assume that people believed in God. Uh, but most people were kind of ate on the scale. They weren't really a Christian. They weren't really a follower of Christ. But if you ask people, do you believe in God? Yeah, they genuinely believed in God. Well, now our culture has really changed such that more people are on this side of the scale, kind of zero to three. They're not sure what they believe or if they believe anything. And that's kind of where we're at. Now, when you, when you look at this in terms of Scripture, there's kind of two different approaches to how you share the gospel with people. For those that believe in God, Peter, in Acts chapter 2, he started with Jesus, he preached Jesus, he ended with Jesus, and 3,000 people got saved. But when you get over to Acts 17, Paul took a completely different approach. Paul took a missionary approach. He saw they had a statue to an unknown God. He's kind of like, I'm not sure if they know who God is. And so he, he panned out and began with creation. He takes them from creation to the resurrection. We're going to look at that in Scripture in just a minute. But let me just say a word about this. Back in the 1970s, uh, you could invite anybody to church. Everybody would come. If you had a crusade, a revival, or a guest speaker, you know, church was kind of like a community center, and everybody would come, even the town drunk. I mean, he would show up at church. He knows people talking about him. He knows people are praying for him. And, and guess what? He's an eight on the scale. He believes in God. He just never surrendered his life to Christ. But today, it's a whole different world. Now, what I am finding in our culture, Harnett County, this happened in Fuquay not too long ago. I was talking to a family. The parents are kind of an eight, and the kids are a three. And I don't have time to explain all the details of it, but the short of it is the parents grew up Catholic in New England, and the guy told me we're holiday Catholics. And I said, Christers, Christers, Christmas and Easter. I said, yeah, kind of like that. And the kids are not involved in anything, and it turned out, in the long story short, uh, the girl had been visiting a Buddhist temple. And I think the, the mom was uh, more comfortable with a Baptist person than a Buddhist person. <laughs> and so... I got to share with them and uh, give them the, the story app. But anyway, that's a long story short. But this is what I'm finding. you got parents that grew up going to church, don't go to church anymore. The kids aren't in church. And so you got a lot of people on this side of the scale. Now, let's look at this in terms of how it, you see it in Scripture. If you've got your Bibles, look at Acts chapter 2. Some of this we'll put on the screen here, and um, we'll see if we can pull this up. All right, let's jump into Acts chapter uh, 2. Let me give you the context real quick because we're not going to spend a lot of time in Acts chapter 2. But... Acts chapter 2 is Pentecost. It's when the Holy Spirit comes down, when Peter's preaching, a lot of people get saved. Let's hear God's word, Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. I'm going to read a few verses. It says, When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and there suddenly came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves and resting on each one. Verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving utterance. Verse 5. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. All right, so this is primarily his audience. They're devout Jews. What do you know about a Jew that's a devout Jew? First of all, a devout Jew believes in God. 
and they believe a Messiah is coming. So on my scale of, you know, zero to ten, they're kind of an eight. They believe in God, they believe the Messiah is coming. So that's kind of where they're at. So when Peter starts preaching, he doesn't try to give them the whole background. He does give them a little bit of Old Testament. When you get over to verse 14, uh, Peter takes his stand, raised his voice, men of Judea and all who are in Jerusalem, let it be known to you, and he begins to preach. He gives them some scripture from Joel, chapter 2, some background. And then when you get all the way over to uh, chapter tw verse 22, I don't know if that will come up here, but Acts 2, 22, uh, he says, men of Israel. So he's really talking to the Jewish people. Listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles. We sang about that and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. Verse 23, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and the foreknowledge of God, you nailed him to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death, but God raised him up again. So he goes right to the resurrection of Jesus, continues to preach. You get over to verse 36. This is Acts 2, verse 36, kind of the summary. He says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you've crucified. Now, folks, that is an absolute mouthful right there. This person, Jesus, whom you've crucified, is both Lord, Adonai, that is God in the flesh, and he's also Christ. He's the Christos. He's the Messiah. So he's God and he's the Messiah. Now, at this point, the people who are listening are under incredible conviction by the power of the Holy Spirit. And they want to know more. And then they ask, and it says in verse 37, it says, Now, when they heard this, they were pierced in their hearts. They said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Folks, I hope that every one of us, every one of you, have come to that place sometime when you realize you've got to do something with Jesus. You've got to respond to him in some way. I was 13 years old. I'd been going to church for a while. I started reading the Bible. I was under conviction. I felt like an elephant was sitting on me. I just had this pressure. And my mom made an appointment with the pastor, and he explained the, the gospel to me and asked me if I was ready to pray and ask Christ into my heart, which I did with him. But then he said something really profound. I'm so glad he did. It changed my life. He said, now, Marty, I want you to go home, pray your own prayer and your own words, and surrender your life. But see, just like these men, they were pierced to their heart. I was pierced to my heart. I knew I needed to do something. I needed to respond to Christ. I didn't know exactly what to do, but I prayed, asked for forgiveness of my sins, and, and asked him to come into my life and to cleanse me, to make me the person that he wanted me to be, and then surrendered my life to him. And when I did that, I felt like I floated off the bed. I was laying flat on my back, and I didn't float at all, but I had this light feeling. Then I kind of had this warm, confident feeling that I now understand was God's Spirit coming into my life. That happened 40-some years ago. I've never gotten over that. But that's what... That's the point that we have to come to at some point where we realize we've got to respond to God, we've got to respond to Christ. So these guys did. And there, it says they were pierced with their heart, and they asked Peter and the other people, what shall we do? Verse 38, Peter says to them, Repent, let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 41, it says there were 3,000 souls added that day. Wow. So, Peter gets up, preaches Jesus, starts with Jesus, preaches Jesus, ends with Jesus, 3,000 people get saved. But the audience already believed in God. Now, if you flip over to uh, chapter 17 of Acts, we're going to see that Paul takes a different approach, and the culture that Paul is speaking into is much more like our culture is today. People aren't really sure, we looked at that, of what they believe or, or how they believe. So let me catch us up here a little bit. We'll leave it on Acts 17, and then uh, we'll jump in. So let me give you a little bit of background. Uh, first of all, Paul goes to uh, Thessalonia, and he's preaching in the synagogue, and they're religious Jews, but they don't like what he's saying. They kick him out. Then he goes to uh, Berea, the Berean Christians. It said they were more noble-minded, and they wanted to search the Scriptures to see if these things were true. Then he goes to Athens, and you get to Athens in verse 16. But let me set this up for you. How many of you all have ever been to Washington, D.C.? Just raise your hand. How many of y'all been to Washington, D.C.? Most people have been to Washington, D.C., been on the mall, but even if you haven't, you know what it looks like. So when we go to Washington, D.C., we go look at all the memorials and the Lincoln Memorial, the, you know, the Jefferson Memorial. We look at all the war memorials, and you go see the Vietnam Wall, and you see those names, and you look for family members. It'll make you cry. It's, it's powerful. 
But in the same way, we're tourists. We're walking around, we're looking at the different monuments, and we're thinking about it. Well, Paul is in Athens, and he's doing something very similar. He's walking around, he's looking at the monuments, he's looking at um, different things on the walls, and he's looking at the tombs and the, the idols and all this stuff, and he comes across this one that says, to the unknown God. And so Paul thinks, okay, there's my connecting point. They don't really know who God is. So we've got to start with the big picture. So I want you to see this. In verse 16, it says, Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him. He was observing a city full of idols. Verse 17. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles. He was in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. So what Paul's doing is what we would call marketplace evangelism, marketplace gospel conversations. I mean, he's just having conversations with all kinds of people, Jews and Gentiles. And then in verse uh, 18, it says, And some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him, and some were saying, What would this idle babbler wish to say? Others says, He seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus in the resurrection. Now, let me talk about that just for a minute. Who are the Epicureans? Who are the Stoics? Well, the Epicureans are the eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. They're to be happy people. And then you got the Stoics. They're just the facts, Jack. Just, you know, give me the, the bottom line. Give me the black and white. And so the point of this is he's talking to Jews and Gentiles. He's talking to Epicureans and Stoics. He's talking to people of every tribe, every nation, every philosophical p point of view. And so he's got all these things going on, and he's just having conversations. But what I want you to see, and don't miss this, this is the best scenario. Paul is going to get invited to come and tell what it is he really believes. And folks, that is one of the best scenarios that we can have in a conversation with somebody is we've listened to their story, we've listened to what they believe, we've respected them, we've not rejected them, we've listened to them, we've not tried to debate them, we've not argued them. By the way, you and I can't change somebody's heart or mind. Only God can do that. And so here's what's going to happen. He's going to get invited up. So look at this in verse 19. Verse 19, it says, And they took him... And they brought him up to the Areopagus, which we call Mars Hill, and saying, May we know this new teaching which you are proclaiming? For you're bringing some strange things to our ears, and we want to know what these things mean. Verse 21 says, Now the Athenians and strangers visiting used to spend their time nothing other than telling and hearing something new. So you get to verse 22, and this is called the Sermon on Mars Hill. So Paul gets up to preach, but notice he doesn't start with Jesus. He starts with the big picture of creation. Verse 22, Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus, and he said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. He's being respectful. Verse 23, For while I was passing through, examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. In verse 24, he starts with creation. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath in all things. Folks, we have an all-sufficient God. Say that with me. He is an all-sufficient God. He doesn't need any help from us. He doesn't need us, but he chooses to love us and call us to himself, which is an amazing thing. Now, he's talking about creation. He's talking about that God doesn't need anything. And then in verse 25, and I'll read that again, it says, Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. He made from the one man, Adam, every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Verse 27, that they would seek God, and that perhaps they may grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Verse 28, in him we live and move and exist. Even some of your own poets have said, for we are his children, we are his offspring. Let me stop there for just a minute. <clears throat> One of the things that most people in our world today wonder about a lot of times, how can I connect with God? How do I reach God? God seems so far out there. And see, even Paul's reminding these people, it says even though you grope for God, he's not far. God is omnipresent. He's all present. He's there. But though he seems a long way from us, he's there. And Paul even connects with their culture and says, even some of your poets have referenced this. They're, they're aware of this, that there is a God and that he's not that far away. And you can know it. And so he goes on to talk about that he created all of us. We're, 
creations of God were his offspring. And then verse 29, he says, Being then the children of God, the offspring of God, we ought not to think of the divine nature as like gold or silver or stones or an image formed by the arts or by the thought of man. Therefore, verse 30, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Repentance means to turn away from your sin, to turn away from your bad thinking. I call it stinking thinking, and think like God wants us to think. It's kind of like this. A lot of times when we hear the word repentance, say this is God, and we're right here, we're all hugged up to God, but we're walking away from God, or our life is going away from God. We often talk about repentance as like making a U-turn and coming back to God. But the word in Greek is really metanoia, which really means to change your mind, change the way you're thinking. It's like <clears throat> you're going away from God and you realize, oh, man, I've got some stinking thinking. I'm not thinking like I need to be thinking or like God wants me to think. And you change your way of thinking and you come back to the way that God would want you to think and be and live. So that's what the repentance really is because this word has been used a number of times today. I wanted to say that. So he says that all people everywhere should repent because God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he's appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Now, when he talks about the resurrection here, he's going to stir up some things. Verse 32, he gets three responses. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer. They mocked him. Others said, hey, we shall hear you again concerning this. So Paul went out of their midst, but some men joined them, and they believed. Among them were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So when you think about Peter in Acts chapter 2, he preached, and 3,000 people were saved that day. But you get over here to Paul, and you've got a couple that are named, and maybe a few more that come to Christ. But more people said, hey, we want to hear you again concerning this. And folks, that's what I'm finding to be true in our culture most of the time. When you share the gospel with somebody or you talk with somebody or you engage them in a conversation and you've not offended them or condemned them or judged them, they want to talk more. They're kind of like, tell me more, explain more. And that's what I've been telling you all along. I was in this restaurant. Um, I love Mexican food. Almost all of my restaurant, all my stories have something to do with Mexican. I think we're going to eat there today probably. But uh, we were at uh, Chewy's Mexican in North Raleigh. I'm with a friend of mine. His name's Steve Noble. He's kind of like a Christian Rush Limbaugh. He has a radio show. He's on on Thursdays, has Theology Thursdays and Free for All Fridays. He's a, a great guy. But anyway, we, we go in, waiter, waiter comes up. His name is Laith, L-A-I-T-H. I said, Laith, is that an Irish name or a Scottish name? He goes, no, actually, it's Arabic. I said, really? I said, where, where are you from? What's your background? He said, well, my mom's a Christian. She's from the United States. My dad's a Muslim. He's from the Middle East. So Steve interjects and says, so what do you believe? He goes, I don't really believe either one. I respect both of them. I don't believe either one. I said, hey, Steve. Uh, Leith, I got something I want to show you. Showed him my phone, the story. It asked four questions about where every culture is, where we come from, all that. Look at it, tell me what you think. So he kind of looks at us, ho-hum, he walks off. He walks back a few minutes later, and he leans over on our table, and he said, can I ask you some questions about Satan and angels? Sure. So we, I thought they would be complicated. They weren't. He just asked a few questions. Thanks, appreciate that. He walks off a few minutes later. He comes back, pulls up a chair, sits down at the table, this is at 1.15 on a Monday afternoon, and said, hey, can I, can I ask y'all some more questions? But not only does Laith join us, the guy who's bussing the tables around us, his name's Will, he's cleaned all the tables around us twice now, nobody sat down, he's listening in. This lady named Aubrey comes up, she is a student at NC State, she comes up and she sits down, Guy comes around the corner. His name is Bo. She motions for him to come. He said, what are y'all doing? She said, sit down. It's her brother. He said, we're having, a, we're having a spiritual conversation. You need to listen in. So four 20-something-year-olds, for the next 45 minutes almost till 2 o'clock, we're answering our questions. We talked about grace and mercy. We shared our testimonies. We talked about the creation and the fall and the rescue, and we answered their questions. And, folks, this is what I'm seeing. People want to talk. They want to have gospel conversations. They just don't want to be beat up about it. And so I said to them, I said, hey, if y'all don't mind me having your email, I'll send the apps to you. You can look it all up yourself. They gave me their email. A month later, we go back, kind of to follow up. And so I asked the lady that was going to see this, the hostess, if any of those people were here today. He said, the only one here today is Bo. I said, well, put me in his section. So come around. Bo sees me, starts grinning. And I, I said, do you remember us? And he said, oh, I remember you. We had a great conversation in the corner about there about a month ago. I said, well, I hope you didn't mind. I asked to be put in your section. He said, oh, no, I was looking forward to talking to you. 
We ended up talking to him for 45 minutes. He was at UNC Wilmington transferring back to state and wants to be an actor. Not sure about the acting at state, but anyway, that's what he said. So we talked to him. So people want to talk. They want to find out more about the Bible and about Jesus. So it's an exciting thing to have opportunity to do that. Now, we need to move on because we need to wrap it up. Here's the four questions. How did it all begin? What went wrong? Is there any hope? And what's the future hold? I was at a football game, Duke versus Carolina. And long story really short, there's a lady a couple seats down from me. There's an open space. Her name was Anna Rockna. We began to talk. And I asked her where she was from. And she told me. And she went to Carolina. She was a graphic arts communication major. I said, are you doing anything with that now? She said, yeah, I work at Duke. I said, how does a Carolina grad end up at Duke? She said, private schools pay more. Well, all right, that's pretty good. So I asked her, so who are you pulling for? And she kind of whispered Carolina. I think the girl with her went to Duke. So anyway... I began to talk to her. And when I asked her, I said, do you have any particular spiritual beliefs? She froze. Just stared at me like not answering that question. And I realized she was super uncomfortable. And so I said, hey, I didn't mean to offend you with that question. I said, I'm a church consultant. I ask everybody if they have any particular beliefs. I'm very curious about what people believe. And that's why I asked that. And she said, oh, I'm Hindu. And she started telling me about it. I said, well, have, have you ever been to Hindu temple? And she said, oh, man, my parents go all the time. And she was talking, talking, talking because I, her story. And so then I, I said, well, let me show you something. So I took my phone out, and I showed her an app. And I said, this is even in eight different Indian languages, including Hindi and uh, Punjabi and some other languages. She said, oh, okay. She said, I have to look it up. So, but I asked her, I started off my conversation by showing her these four questions. And I said, do Hindus have these questions? And she said, sir, every culture has these questions. Where do we come from? What went wrong? Is there any hope? And what's the future hope? So it's a great way to engage people. We talked about eternity in our hearts. Everyone needs to hear the whole gospel story. It answers the deep questions of life. And also the gospel is the only thing that answers some of those things. The good news of what Jesus has done. And when we say gospel, it means good news. But what we're really talking about is the, the perfect life of Jesus who came to live a perfect sinless life. He died a perfect death in our place on the cross and he resurrected, and he's coming back. And so when we talk about the gospel, we're talking about all the great things that Jesus is and has done and is going to do. That's the good news of Jesus. Now, our culture has changed. I want to I talk about the three-story method. Listen to their story. Tell them your story. Tell them his story. Say that with me. Say, listen, say their story, my story, his story. All right, let me, I'll wrap it up with this story. I was in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, with a bunch of people from the Baptist State Convention. We'd gone to a conference in downtown Nashville, Tennessee. It's kind of like the Baptist Vatican there. You've got Lifeway and the big Baptist building. And they're in, it's like an L shape. And inside there is a Holiday Inn Express. And they told us that, hey, we've got a shuttle. We'll take you anywhere you want to go. And you talk about an international group. There's nine of us and only three white guys like me. One of them was Neil that we talked about earlier and Eddie Thompson. We had a guy from the Dominican Republic, Korea. Um, Honduras, uh, Philippines, and African-American guy, and one other country I've left out. I can't remember, but we were quite a mixed group. So anyway, guess where everybody wanted to go eat lunch? Mexican. Not kidding. So we get on the bus. So I sit up front, Eddie Thompson, I sit up front, and you know, I'm, you figured out I like to talk to people, so I sit and talk, start talking to the driver. His name is Thurman. I said, Thurman, I said, are you from Nashville? He said, yep, I'm a native Nashvillian. I said, are you a Titans fan? Oh, yeah, I got season tickets, never miss a home game. So, man, we're connecting. We're talking about the Titans, and we're talking about football, and you know how exciting that is. Um, and then I said, Thurman, have you ever heard of Thurman Munson? He goes, Thurman Munson, you're talking about the catcher for the Yankees in the 70s. He said, it's always guys that are your age that ask me that question. <laughs> so he's kind of ragging me. But we're having a very chummy conversation. Then I asked Thurman my favorite question. So Thurman, do you have any particular spiritual beliefs? Folks, you had thought I'd flipped a light switch. The whole place changed. His, it became ominous. He goes, I'm a Wiccan. I mean, it's like this nice chummy dude all of a sudden turns into my enemy or something. And man, he went into fight mode. And everybody on the bus is thinking, Marty has really made the driver mad. And Marty is thinking, Marty has really made the driver mad. <laughs> but I just interviewed him. That's what I typically do. I said, Thurman, wow, that's interesting. I said, tell me about that. What are some of your beliefs as a Wiccan? He goes, I believe in gods and goddesses. And he went on a rant about that. 
And then I asked him, I said, well, Thurman, have you ever read the Bible? Oh, I know all about the Bible. I know about Constantine and the 66 canonical text. And Constantine helped put the Bible together, true. And Constantine was the first pope. Not true, but he just went on, and I didn't stop him. I didn't argue with him. And then he started in on everything wrong with the church, Steve. He started naming everything wrong with the church. I found myself kind of nodding my head. He got to about the fifth thing, and I said, yeah, Christians don't always act like we're supposed to. I didn't, he didn't slow down, and I didn't interrupt him. And you know me. I, I've got booklets. I've got stuff on my phone. I've got cards in my pocket. I mean, I'm, you know, a good soldier does two things. You prepare for battle and make sure you've got plenty of ammo, okay? So I carry a lot of different things with me when an opportunity presents itself. Have some ammo. But uh, anyway, I didn't give him anything. I just kept talking, kept asking questions, let him talk. So we go eat. We get back on the bus, and now Thurman has turned back in to Mr. Howdy Duty, And he says to me when I get back on the bus, I like the way you talk to me. I didn't talk much. I just asked questions. But he repeated it. He goes, I like the way you talk to me. Now, remember, I'm not assuming anything. I'm still asking questions. I said, what do you mean by that, Thurman? He said, are you a preacher? I said, well, yeah, I am. I said, I'm also a church consultant. I try to help churches do the things that you said we don't do very well. He said, well, the next time you're in a church, he said, you talk to people. You tell them to talk to people like you talk to me. What he meant was I was respectful. I didn't argue, I didn't debate, I didn't condemn him. So, but I asked him another question. I said, so what do, you, what do you mean by that, Thurman? He said, well, most of the time when I run into Christians, especially a preacher, they tell me I'm wrong and I'm going to hell. He said, but you didn't do that. He said, why, why didn't you do that? I said, well, Thurman, one of the things I've learned and I understand is I cannot change your heart. I said, only God can change your heart if he wants to and if you're willing to let him. He goes, you might be right about that. I'm thinking, dude, I know I'm right about that. So then he says, so what's your story? So I told him my testimony of how I became a Christian when I was 13. And by this time, we're all back. We're getting off the bus. Eddie stayed to pray for me. We're having a great conversation. So then he asked me, he said, so what do you believe? So I pulled out a little Bible study called Steps to Peace with God by Billy Graham. Some of y'all have heard of Billy Graham, the great evangelist. Billy Graham wrote a book called Steps to Peace with God. This is a booklet, a, a summary of his little book. And I began to explain it to him. And he's just turning the pages. And we're going through it. You know, God has a plan for you. He loves you. John 3, 16. Our sin separates us. And the thing I like about this book, it's very visual. It's kind of like if this is God, it shows how there's a gap between man and God. And how mankind is trying to reach God through being good, going to church, having a good philosophy, trying to live a good life. And how all those things are a gap. And it shows how the cross is a bridge from God to man. Man being over here, God being here. And the cross is a bridge. But I'm going through this. He's flipping it. And he goes, I like the way you're doing this. And I laughed at myself. I thought, I'm just explaining the gospel to you and, you. and you thought it was nice. And I thought that was pretty cool. So we finish up. We read the little prayer to him at the end. And I, and I kind of laughed with him. I said, when you ever come to that place when you're ready to be a Christian, I said, that's an example of how you can pray. Nothing magical, but how you can ask Christ to forgive you and come into your life. He kind of snickered a little bit, but that's all right. And I, and I said... Man, I've really enjoyed talking with you, Thurman. He said, I've enjoyed talking to you. I said, but before I go, i got one more question for you. I said, do you have a Bible? He goes, I might have a Bible. I'm thinking, no, I know you got a Bible. I said, here's my question for you. Here's my challenge for you. I want you to ask God, the God of creation, if he's really real, that he'll reveal himself to you. I said, do you think you can do that? He said, that's a good question. I said, well, take your Bible and put it in the reading room, and when you're in there in the morning, it only takes five minutes to read a chapter in the Bible, just starting with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, read straight through the New Testament and just five minutes a day. And every time, ask God if he's real to reveal himself to you. He said, that's a good challenge. I can do that. I said, well, man, this has been great. I know you got to go. Thanks again. One more thing. Can I pray for you before I go? Oh, no, I'm good. He wasn't going to let me pray for him. But, folks, this is similar to what Paul did. Paul's talking to people, engaging conversations, talking to Epicureans, talking to the Stoics, talking to the Jews, talking to the Gentiles. He gets invited to tell a story. He gets invited to tell what he believes. So the three-story method. You listen to their story. Say their story. You tell them your story. Say my story. And you tell them his story. Say his story. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for this time in your word. Thank you for this time uh, to look into... That's pretty cool. Uh, Father, we just uh, commit this day to you. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your house with your people and to be online with your people. Father, thank you for those that are listening today that may not be 100% sure where they stand with you, but help them to know, Lord, that you love them 
you have a plan for their life, that you're calling them and drawing them to yourself. Father, we're all sinners. We're all broken. We all need you. I can't fix myself. I can't fix other people. But, Lord, you can fix us. And you do so through the gospel, through the good news of Jesus, his perfect life and death. Father, some of us are here today, and we're wondering um, how, how do we connect with you. And, and it's as simple as it was said earlier. We can pray, and we can talk to you. Thank you, Lord, that you have created an avenue that we can talk to you through prayer. We can have a relationship with you. We can know you. So, Father, if there's somebody here today or in the hearing of my voice that has never surrendered to Jesus, may today be the day of surrender and salvation. And, Father, I pray uh, that we'll respond in obedience to you as a Christian, uh, that we'll seek to reach out to our friends, to pray for our friends, to share our testimony, to engage people in gospel conversations. Fill us with your spirit. Make us bold. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Steve's going to come and explain the blue bag and how you can have a relationship with Christ and how you can be connected to this church. So, Steve, thank you so much. Thanks, Marty. All right, you can't say anything about me talking fast ever again. Faster than I do, doesn't he? See, you didn't think it was possible. Uh, anyway, he talked about um, the, 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 the steps to God, steps to of God, and that's actually part of what's in our blue bag. So if you would like to talk about how to find that relationship with Christ, if you're in the auditorium, of course, we've got the blue bags here and here and there. And if you are not in the auditorium and you go to our, fix, fix that a couple times. Oh, there it is. This line, can you follow me with the camera? Can you get this right? You got this? That is the online blue bag, and it has the <laughs> steps to peace with God in it as part of that process. So if you'd like to follow that along, you can go right there and you can get that. Um, as always, if you'd like to be baptized, let us know. Baptism at SouthSprings.org. If you'd like to be part of our church community, Steve at SpouseFrenchs.org, and we'll work that out. Anyway, thanks, Marty. I Tell hope some of those resources are out on the table. Oh, you've got some of your stuff on the table for those of you in the auditorium. Thanks, Rich. A um, anyway, thanks, Marty. Thanks for coming. Let's let's sing one more song. If you want to, if you want to um, pray during this song, we got a cross over here. We can take communion. All right, all right. Let's go. Let's worship.